Are video games art? It's a subjective question, but this has been a question that has followed the games industry since its inception. Video games are going to become a new art form. I don't, I don't think they're there yet. They're fun. Um, they're not art, but they could be art. Could video games be viewed through the same lens as literature or film? While I and many others believe that games have always been a form of art, the idea wasn't widely accepted by critics until a small development team out of Boston led by Ken Levine created one of the most influential games of its time. Bioshock. Bioshock was developed by Irrational Games as a spiritual successor to the System Shock series, specifically System Shock 2. With first-person shooter mechanics spliced with some RPG elements and a real focus on a narrative and world building, Bioshock quickly shot to the top of everyone's Game of the Year list when it launched in August of 2007. When discussing video games, I find gameplay to be the most important aspect, considering it's the defining feature of the medium. And even though the narrative of Bioshock is what's lauded by most, the game's also extremely enjoyable on the gameplay front. Bioshock's gameplay is split in a third so to speak. One third shooting, one third exploration, and one third RPG, with a near seamless overlap between each third. The way players interact with the world of Bioshock is through the first person perspective, whether that's firing weapons, searching containers, or looting corpses for precious survival items, or Bioshock's most unique and defining gameplay mechanic, utilizing plasmids. Plasmids are a fantastic addition to what would otherwise be seen as a standard first person shooter. Through injecting Adam into one's system, plasmids are essentially superpowers, giving players the ability to shoot lightning or fire from their fingertips, pick up and throw objects with their minds, hypnotize enemies, or even summon a swarm of insects to neutralize threats. Plasmids open up the combat of Bioshock tremendously. There's nothing quite like shocking a pool of water a splicer is standing in and switching to your shotgun to blow away another that's barreling towards you. The sheer amount of combat combinations is almost kind of staggering when it comes to plasmids and the weapons players can wield. While the first person shooter mechanics can be seen as archaic by today's standards, it still feels good to shoot splicers with a shotgun or blast a big daddy with an electro bolt. Think Halo or Doom and not necessarily Call of Duty or Rainbow Six. Similar to first-person shooters of old, Bioshock outfits players with an array of weapons to choose from with the ever-popular weapon wheel. Players' arsenals grow as they progress further into the game, starting with the iconic wrench and eventually having access to machine guns, shotguns, crossbows, grenade launchers, and even a chemical thrower. The enemies players face in Rapture are almost as varied as the weapons and plasmids they wield against them. Splicers are the main threat you'll face in Rapture and come in a few different flavors. Melee-focused splicers rush players with lead pipes or other blunt objects, and can even sneak up behind you. Your run-of-the-mill armed enemies with pistols or machine guns, as well as a grenade-tossing splicer, can keep you on your toes. But the more interesting variants are those imbued with plasmid-like powers. Spider and Houdini splicers have the ability to hang and climb on walls or ceilings, or disappear into thin air respectively. These enemies are vastly more interesting to fight because they change up player tactics from the usual running and gunning. Checking above you to make sure a spider splicer doesn't drop down in front of you, or frantically looking around for where a Houdini splicer might spawn next mixes up the usual enemy encounters. While Splicers aren't a massive threat on their own, their more integral purpose is to heighten Bioshock's atmosphere and world building. These aren't generic soldiers, they're once citizens of Rapture, now twisted into atom addicted junkies. Their nonsensical ramblings, erratic behavior, and masked or disfigured faces sells the world of Rapture's downfall even more. Rapture citizens aren't the only ones players have to be wary of. Rapture's security system consists of flying security bots, cameras, and turrets. While not always direct threats, security cameras can force players to be more stealthy, sneaking around them or taking them out at a distance as to not be spotted. And if you're spotted, having to deal with what seems like endless flying bots can make any bad splicer situation worse. Turrets stationed in certain locations can mow players down with machine gun fire or launch volley of rockets, making them dangerous hazards as well. But the most threatening enemy that roams the dystopian halls of Rapture has to be the iconic Big Daddy. Similarly to splicers, these come in a few variants, namely the Bouncer and the Rosie. The more famous of the two is the Bouncer. With its massive drill, it'll charge anything it sees as a threat to its little sister. On the flip side, the Rosie keeps its distance, firing firing its rivet gun and peppering the battlefield with proximity mines for those not keeping track of their surroundings. The Big Daddies, Little Sisters, and Splicers form this fascinating triangle of interaction within Bioshock. With the Splicers attempting to hunt down the Little Sisters for Adam, the Big Daddies protecting the Little Sisters by killing their attackers, and then the Little Sisters harvesting them, it's an interesting organic relationship that can play out in real time as players explore Rapture. Players can even take advantage of these interactions, using them as a distraction to sneak past a fight, or having a Splicer chip away at a Big Daddy's health, then finishing them off themselves. Just another layer that adds 
as the depiction of Rapture and why it's so special. The overlapping RPG mechanics in combat or enemy variety is the research camera. Similar to something like Dead Rising, players can use the research camera to take pictures of enemies. The better the picture, the more points you earn towards researching that particular enemy. Get enough points and you're rewarded with a buff in combat for that particular enemy. It's a very subtle but effective tool to use when exploring Rapture that just increases the depth of Bioshock's gameplay that much more. Each of the game's six weapons have three different ammo types the players can swap between, effectively tripling the option players have in combat. Incendiary ammo, anti-personnel ammo, trip wires, proximity mines, and even liquid nitrogen are all available to the player if they can find them, which leads us into the exploration aspect of Bioshock. Bioshock's level design hits an almost perfect sweet spot for me personally. It's not quite as linear as a Call of Duty, but it's not an open world game similar to something like Rage. Rapture is segmented into traditional levels accessed by bathyspheres or bulkhead doors, and each area has its own unique feel and aesthetic. Each area within Rapture is a mini hub of sorts, with a direct path to the player's goal, with branching sections and hidden areas for players to explore. Exploring Rapture is key to surviving as ammo, health, and Eve for your plasmids are scarce. Irrational took some aspects of the Resident Evil franchise in the survival horror genre to enhance Bioshock's gameplay and atmosphere. Bioshock isn't categorized as a horror game, but it could be. The atmosphere established is that of dread. Barely lit hallways, corpses strewn about, crazed messages and blood written on the walls. Hideous and insane former citizens skulk the halls trying to survive, attacking anything in their path. Bioshock's tone fits its atmosphere effectively as players explore awe-inspiring locales ruined by the downfall of a society. Players also have the ability to hack a wide variety of objects throughout Rapture, whether that be safes to crack to gather their contents, locked doors to open up access to new areas, vending machines to lower prices on integral items, or even security bots or turrets to help fight back against a splicer onslaught. Exploration of Rapture is also where the majority of the lore and backstory of Bioshock can be found through an abundance of audio logs, a feature Bioshock popularized that's still used to this day, but we'll get to those when we touch on the story in a bit. The sheer amount of options in both combat and exploration intertwine near perfectly with Bioshock's RPG elements. The RPG aspects of Bioshock exponentially expand player freedom and choice, which is something I appreciate immensely. The ability to play Bioshock however the player wants is quite refreshing in 2020, where the ability is more of an illusion in modern titles. Enhancements are scattered throughout Rapture in the form of tonics and weapon upgrades, which can define how you play Bioshock. These upgrades not only make players stronger, but are also woven into the other two-thirds of Bioshock's gameplay. Want to upgrade your favorite weapon to fire faster or do more damage? Explore every nook and cranny to find those elusive power to the people stations. Pesky security systems ruining your day? Equip the security evasion tonic that delays cameras from spotting you too fast. Want an extra plasmid slot or health upgrade? Well, you'll need Adam for that, so you better take out that big daddy protecting that little sister, and once you do, do you harvest them for even more Adam, or save them for less Adam but a cleaner conscience? The choice is yours. One word I think about most when talking about Bioshock is depth. Depth in combat when it comes to numerous weapons, ammo types, and plasmids, depth in player choice through its RPG elements, and depth in exploration with incredible world building through audio logs or visual design. In a nutshell, Bioshock, through its gameplay, is an incredible game with layers of depth in every aspect of its design. It's a lovely little package, but its narrative is the shiny red bow that ties it all together into something truly remarkable. The level of depth and maturity from Bioshock's narrative is what critics point to when categorizing it as a work of art. The plot, mostly penned by Levine, was heavily inspired by the works of Ayn Rand or George Orwell, focusing on the utopian city of Rapture. Rapture, in my opinion, is one of the best worlds to have been brought to life, in video games or otherwise. The attention to detail Irrational paid to Rapture is what makes it so fleshed out and interesting. It keeps what would otherwise be looked at as a silly concept, a fully functional 1960s city under the ocean, as grounded and believable. Small touches like being able to peer out viewports into the ocean outside the walls of Rapture's many halls and watch schools of fish swim by neon advertisements solidifies this place as a living, breathing world. The Art Deco architecture reminiscent of Rockefeller is beautiful even more than 10 years after release. Each area of the city is brought to life in excruciating detail and its inhabitants reflect what Rapture has become. It's not just the visual design that adds to Rapture, but those audio logs I mentioned earlier. Audio logs are everywhere in Rapture, and nearly every one of them is filled with interesting tidbits about the world and its characters. The audio logs give insight to characters' philosophies, politics, or moral standings, and without even seeing them in-game, you feel like you know these people. Germans. All they can talk about is blue eyes and the shape of forehead. All I care about is, why is this one born strong and that one weak? This one smart, that one stupid. All that killing. You think the Germans could have been interested in something useful? 
mostly because of how well written the dialogue is. While audio logs today aren't utilized effectively, Bioshock used them to bring an already interesting world to new heights. Rapture's denizens are far and away one of the most interesting parts of Bioshock. In a world where there are no limits, disaster is almost inevitable. Two of the more interesting residents of Rapture are Dr. Steinman and Sander Cohen. Both took their trades very seriously, and without the restrictions of the surface world like morality or ethics, both went insane trying to create something that would mirror what Rapture stood for. Steinman was a plastic surgeon of sorts in the medical pavilion of Rapture. He was exceptional at what he did, but through atom abuse and the sheer boredom of simple procedures, Steinman took his craft too far. When Picasso became bored of painting people, he started representing them as cubes and other abstract forms. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could do with a knife what that old Spaniard did with a brush? He started to sculpt humans to his demented perfect standard, mutilating his patients in search for the perfect nose, the perfect smile, or the perfect face. Without any barriers to stop himself, Steinman went mad trying to chase perfection. That one! Too fat! This one! Too tall! This one! Too symmetrical! And now! What's this guy? An intruder! He's ugly! 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 Okay! Sander Cohen was similar in that he chased perfection in the arts. Cohen was a very proud man almost to a fault, as he saw his art to be the bar others would have to reach for. Would you possibly think I would meet with my public now, when I'm preparing unbelievable? Through his atom abuse, he started eliminating all those who criticized him, deeming them too dim-witted to understand true art. Oh god, you sick fuck, let me out of there! He started making sculptures from corpses and torturing or killing those who couldn't reach his standards. Uh, what's that look? No, I can do you. I don't need to be judged by you, by anyone. Screw you! Screw all you fucking doubters! Here's what I say to all of you! Both of these characters exemplify the worst of Rapture's vision, of its founder's vision, an equally as interesting character in Andrew Ryan. Ryan's vision for Rapture as a shining beacon of society is just so damn fascinating to think about. Sharing similarities to Plato's Republic, Ryan wanted to create a city where anyone could be or do anything, with no limits enforced by religion or government, where the greatest minds in the world could flourish at their trades, only bound by their own will and drive to create. City where the artist would not fear the sense of where the scientists would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small. His extreme free market approach to the economy of Rapture, dubbed the Great Chain of Industry, where no regulations or rules would dictate how the market would flow, but only its people's own self-interest in which way they pulled the proverbial chain. His idea of removing barriers and restrictions for the world's most brilliant and talented people was both a noble and naive concept, and his idea of a perfect world under the sea appropriately spiled into chaos as Rapture's sheer freedoms, along with the introduction of Adam into the populace, would inevitably lead to its downfall. The idea of Rapture seemed far more important to Ryan than its inhabitants. So much so, he betrayed his own ideals after he started to lose control of the city he built, forcefully taking control of businesses or ruthlessly killing those who oppose him, directly conflicting the very concept of rapture itself. Needless to say, Andrew Ryan is an incredibly fascinating individual. On the surface, the parasite expects the doctor to heal them for free, the farmer to feed them out of charity. How little they differ from the pervert who prowls the streets looking for a victim he can ravish for his grotesque amusement. I don't normally do this, but I'm going to put up a spoiler warning for what I'm about to discuss. The twist to Bioshock is one of the most interesting concepts and the most brilliant piece of video game writing I've come across, and I can't in good faith spoil that for those who haven't experienced Bioshock yet. So, would you kindly brace yourself for spoilers in 3, 2, one. While it's pretty clear that Bioshock's writing is spectacular, the twist about halfway through the game is something truly special. Something that plays with the idea of player agency and the very concept of video games as a whole. Throughout the game, players are guided through Rapture's many horrors by Atlas, a man desperately in search for his family and a way out of Rapture alive. Listen, I've got a family. I need to get them out of here. But the splicers have cut me off from them. If you can reach them in Neptune's bounty, then maybe, just maybe, Atlas directs the player through various missions and tasks accented by the phrase, Would you kindly? Careful now. Would you kindly?
kindly lower that weapon for a minute? Would you kindly leg it over to the sphere and get on down to Hephaestus? Now would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch? What I and many others thought was just a simple phrase used to make Atlas more charming or likable was actually a trigger phrase for the player character Jack. It turns out Jack is being manipulated by Atlas with that phrase the entire game to do his bidding. Would you kindly? Powerful phrase. Familiar phrase. Would you kindly? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch? At the time, and somewhat even today, this revelation blew my mind. It turned everything I knew about writing or storytelling in video games upside down. This very moment is what I believe people reference when they say Bioshock is a work of art because this moment could not be replicated in a movie or book. The idea of manipulating player agency through a phrase woven into the narrative as players go on their merry way doing video gamey things is sheer brilliance. To make players question everything they known up to that point, not only of their confidant Atlas, or Frank Fontaine at this point, but their actions is something truly spectacular, and it only adds on top of everything I've already raved about up to this point. In the end, what separates a man from a slave? Money? Power? No. A man chooses. A slave obeys. My first experience with Bioshock will always stick with me. Upon hearing all the praise the game was getting, I rented it from Gamefly, and when I got it, I popped it into my shiny new Xbox 360. As I descended into the ocean, I was introduced to Andrew Ryan for the first time, and I became incredibly fascinated by the adventure that awaited me. And then the splicer attack happened, and I immediately shut the game off and didn't return to it until years later. <laughs> but I'm very glad that I did. Bioshock is by no means perfect, no game truly is, but it comes very close to it. It's a game where each aspect stands on its own as an achievement. The gameplay and narrative mesh so well thanks to its incredible writing. The world of Rapture to this day is something to strive for when establishing environments for any piece of media. The sophistication of its themes and ideas set a high standard only few have reached since its release nearly 15 years ago. While Irrational Games no longer exist, those involved with the original Bioshock's development were part of history as they created one of the most compelling and innovative games to date. Bioshock is simply a masterpiece and worthy of its praise as a work of art. They told me, son, you're special. You were born to do great things. You know what? They were right.